GIT 500 Writing Up Research How you write up research is really important because you can do the greatest research in the world, but if you can't communicate it to others, you've sort of wasted your time. And really, to understand how to do research, how to conduct it, how to write it up, you actually have to do it. So that's part of what you're going to be doing. It is what you're going to be doing for your final um, project assignment in this course. You're going to be writing a research report and it doesn't just lay out what happened in the study, it, it really first operates as a map. So if you wrote a research proposal or not, your research paper lays out the procedure, makes it easier for you to stay on track. So you know how to start the study. You know you have to pick a problem you'd like to solve or a question you'd like to answer or a topic area that you'd like to explore. And there are lots of ways to write up research. The most common way in academia is the five chapter research report. There are other ways that you can write up um, reports based on if they are case studies or usability tests, but we're going to talk about the five chapter research report because that's what you're going to be doing for this course. Here is what goes into a five chapter research report. We're going to be going through this one by one, particularly the items that are in brown, but it does start with a, a title page that has a specific format not too worried about that for this class. An abstract, and that's just sort of like an executive summary of what happened in the study. Again, we're not necessarily going to worry about that for this course. Then you will have a table of contents, which you'll need, and that's what you see an example of here. And then the five chapters, and then after the five chapters, you have a references page where you're gonna put all your sources and an appendix if you have any, uh, usually will at least have maybe the survey that you send out. You might have other things you want to put in the appendix should you want in the paper, but you don't necessarily want in the body of the paper. The first chapter is the chapter one introduction, and in that you're going to be giving a brief introduction to the general area of study, uh, what the project is needed for, who does the uh, project benefit? What's the significance of the project? A problem statement, why this study is needed. And then your research purpose, your main goal, your overarching goal. Then, of course, research objectives or research questions. Uh, something called limitations and assumptions. And then a summary. And just FYI, all chapters in a five-chapter um, paper need a summary, an introduction at the beginning of the chapter, and a brief summary at the end. In an, the introduction chapter, you want to introduce what you want to study. So what is the area, broad area of study? Why is it important to investigate? What's happened in the, this area in the past? And how will this study add to the body of knowledge? A good structure or approach to this is to establish a broad area of research and then identify a research niche within that bigger area of research and then put your research in that niche. Don't try to do anything too broad. You, it's much easier to do research and it's much more meaningful actually to pick a little smaller piece of the area that you want to study. You're going to have to show need. Why is it needed? Base this on citable facts. And remember in chapter one, you can write whatever you want, actually in all the chapters, one, two, three, four, but you have to have a reputable source that says the same thing. And then you have to cite that source. So it's something you believe, go find a red, reputable source and then cite it to them. You can't just say whatever you want. If this is not an opinion paper. It's not a persuasion paper, right? So you have to base things on citable facts. Why is it needed? Uh, who would benefit? So you can um, start with 
big info and, and specific to your study. And then you need a problem statement. So that is a brief statement describing what you're trying to address. And what's the problem that you're trying to investigate, explore, whatever it is you're trying to do. One of the questions that faculty have is why do students stop attending class at the end of the semester or near the end of the semester? A problem statement related to that might be studies, and then we give a citation there of two different um, sources, right? So they say the same thing. It's stronger because I have two sources cited here, and that's how you do it. So cite one and then a semicolon, cite the other one. Studies show that when college students habitually skip class, assignment and exam scores are significantly lower. The lack of attendance grows as as the end of the semester approaches. The purpose of the study is to identify the reasons for absenteeism at the end of the semester or as the end of the semester approaches. So that is my problem statement. It says why I want to study this and, wh and what the purpose of it is. You know, like what's the background for it and what it is I want to do. You need to break down the problem into achievable or ansible steps by creating research objectives or research questions. We've talked about that before. Remember that you want to write research objectives or research questions. I'm going to give you examples of both for this research problem. My first research objective would be to discover the past two semesters attendance rates in GIT, maybe for a specific class, but maybe overall. Identify reasons for increased absenteeism at the end of semesters, and then explore other possible influences not named as reasons. So I can actually like have results from each of these. I can discover things, I can identify, explore. I could use probably a stronger verb than that, but that I can also show how I explored. I might actually, you know, do that through the literature review, who knows. Anyway, if I wanted to write them in research objectives, that's how I'd write them. If I wanted to do the same objectives, but write them as research questions, this is what I would write. What's the rate of attendance? What are the reasons that students give? And then what are other possible influences? Doesn't matter which way you go, but use one or the other. Do not mix statements uh, objective statements and research questions. Limitations are things that come after you've listed your research uh, objectives or research questions numbered. Remember, we like to number those. Limitations are just how you think the study might be limited. For example, you didn't have enough time to really do the research well. Maybe you had poor access to the population you wanted to have. It has nothing to do with the study itself. It's just how, what would keep you from doing the study best. And then assumptions are things, you, you don't necessarily have to include these, not in this class anyway, but these are things that you believe as fact that you assume are true so that you're not addressing them in the research but you have to say you know we assume that all students just get tired by the end of the semester and so that's not something we're going to look at that would be an assumption and then uh, again with every chapter end it with a short summary and all you have to do is restate general topic, the general topic area of your study, and then you can do a brief introduction to chapter two. Let's talk about chapter two. The literature review is like parachuting out of a plane. I think that's the best way to describe how to write a literature. The first thing you're gonna do is write an introduction, which you need for every chapter, and you, just generally need to say that you're going to be looking at sources that give background on the topic area. You can also, if you want, to talk about the importances of literature reviews, um, two studies, 
and then you'll start your adventure of jumping out of the plane. You're, when you jump out of a plane, I've never done this, but you're parachuting, right? And they drop you and you can see this big X on the ground. They have this big landing spot for you very often. So if you first jump out of that plane, that landing spot's way down there. You can see a lot. You have a very broad view. So that's what, where you want to start. You want to start with that broad view and discuss general topic, the general topic area, right? So you're not talk, getting down to specifics. You start out with a very wide view. And that might be presenting historical information, including past research, right? So that's sort of big, broad um, view. Uh, and then as you fall, you'll see the target a little bit better, but you'll still see other things, but you'll see them better. You'll see less things than you saw before, but you'll see them closer up. And that's when you break the big general area or areas into more specific areas closer to your topic area. And then finally, you get to the ground, you land on your target, and that's where your specific topic is, right? So you start very broad, and you just kind of whittle it down until you're to your specific topic area. That's how you write a literature review. And then, of course, don't forget the summary. Chapter 3, Methodology, is where you explain the methods for getting and analyzing your study data. It's basically just what you are going to do or what you did to get that information. You're going to start this chapter with an introduction, but then uh, by explaining what your study approach was or is. Uh, and of course that should include one of these three, quantitative, qualitative, and mixed or mixed methods. And then you can also talk about the like more specific ways of how you did it, like it was cross-sectional, it was a before and after study, it was a longitudinal study, and that kind of thing. You don't really have to go in too much in the weeds at this level. Then you want to give an overview of your whole process. How did you, you know, uh, you came up with a research problem, and then you defined your population, and then you, you know, you can go through that. They're uh, in the examples in the, um, on Canvas, there should be some examples of how you can actually do this in a visual way. In a chart, like an arrow chart, you can see the actual process. It really makes it clearer in your head of what you need to do when. And it also helps, if you put it in your research paper, the, the reader of your paper understand what you did and in what order. Um, you should talk about each step in this overview of how you determined or de defined the participant participants. Um, how you created and distributed the data collection instruments, and I'm talking past tense, really in writing these research papers, you write it in present tense as you're doing the study, and then you're supposed to go back in and fix everything to past tense when it's all over. We don't worry about it too much for this assignment, but for if you were doing this for an applied project or or company research or something, you would want to go back in and make it past tense. And that's why I'm speaking that way. Uh, and then also how, how what, what ways are you going to analyze the results? And then of course the summary. In chapter four, the results chapter, you're going to display those results, the results you got from your data collection in a graphical manner, also in a textual manner in a way. In the text, you're going to start with the question that you asked in this, um, we're going to assume we're talking about a survey here. You start with the question, you put it in your text, you just say, question four, why do students not come to class, or whatever it is. You're going to then briefly describe the data, you know, 72% of these people said that. You're going to then refer in that text to the figure or the table that shows the results of this question. You're going to write that in the, um, in the text as well. 
and then you're going to show that figure or table after that. Remember that in chapter four, you're just reporting the findings, just the facts. You're not making any kind of conclusions, drawing any kind of conclusions of what you think the data means. That's not what chapter four is about, that's chapter five. This is an example of a chart that would be used for showing GIT students reasons for not attending class. And you can see it's set up properly. It's got the figure number. It's got a title. It's a little tight in there. I would put more space there, but couldn't do it in the presentation. It has percentages of students on the y-axis along the left. And you see the percentages go all the way to 100%, which is what you should do. And then on the x-axis along the bottom, you see the reasons for non-attendance. And that is labeled as well, reasons for non-attendance. And then you see the actual reasons, right? And then the numbers above each bar are the percentages. Not the actual counts, but the percentages, because that is more meaningful, as we talked about when we talked about displaying data. So here's the example. We would write this up this way. Question five, which of the following are reasons why you stop attending class? This, we put, put this in the paper itself in chapter four. And then after that, we would write, as shown in figure seven, the most common reasons for non-attendance is because of anxiety for 71% of GIT students. Boom. That doesn't say why you think that is. You don't talk about why you think they're anxious. It just says that is what they told you. And I, I put the text as shown in figure seven in maroon. You don't do that in the paper, but you can use that verbiage to refer to the figure. You can say in a parenthesis, see figure seven. You can, there are different ways you can say it, but you need to refer to the figure in the text. Now, in chapter five, the conclusions and recommendations chapter, you, for the first time, are allowed to give your opinion of the data. You need to tell the reader what you think it all means. And you do that by answering your research objectives or questions. Again, start with a brief introduction to the study as a whole, you know, what, what the purpose was, what the overarching goal was, and then you're going to revisit each of the research objectives or questions one at a time. Don't just sit, like go and just answer everything because it doesn't always make sense that way. It's much easier if you revisit them and address them one at a time. Uh, for the user to understand what they're reading. To answer these or address the objectives or answer the questions, use information both from your literature review that apply to it and or the results of your data collection. Be very specific when referring to the source of the information and data. Cite things. You still need to cite things. So if you pull something, information out of your literature review, make sure you bring the citation with it. Um, and again, cite sources and then um, refer to specific survey questions. You're like, as shown in, you know, question seven in the survey, which was blah, blah, blah. That makes it just so much more clear. You don't want people having to like go back in your paper and figure out what the question was or, or what you're talking about. Put it all in there. It's okay to repeat yourself. Here's an example. Uh, my main research goal for this is to determine why student attendance in class decreases at the end of semesters. And my research objectives were discover past two semesters attendance rates, identify their reasons, and explore their influences not named as reasons. Okay, this is the same one that I've been talking about. Here's how I would write it up. Research objective number one, discover past two semesters attendance in GIT. So I would just write this as a heading. So it would be bolded, it would be using the regular heading uh, levels in APA. Um, it stands out. People can obviously see what 
we're talking about. And then in regular text, I would talk about what I found. Data gathered from several GIT courses from blah, 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 blah. Show approximately 26% of students stop attending class after the semester midpoint. This is shown in figure 10 below. So I could show the graph again. If I show the graph again, I give it a new figure number because they need to go in order. It's okay that I've repeated it. If I want to show it, I can. You don't have to. You can just talk about it and refer back to it. Um, you know, which question asked that. Um, whatever you need to do. You can talk about what you think this means here if you want as well. I didn't, but you could. Um, and here's another one, research objective number two, which to, was to identify the reasons. GIC students identified several reasons for not attending classes, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then uh, I say at the end, this aligns with prior research, and then I have a citation, right? So I'm not just talking about the data that I got from students, um, which I probably should have put a percentage and referred back to like survey items, but I also brought in some of the stuff I learned in my literature review. Then at the end of um, chapter five, well, you're going to give your conclusions. And remember, when we say conclusions, we don't mean summary. We mean it's not the conclusion, it's not the end. It's your conclusions about what the data means, all right? So you need to talk about what you think it all means. Uh, remember, it's okay to repeat yourself or repeat data or to refer back to survey, survey items or to figures and tables in the paper. It's okay to repeat yourself. Uh, it, it makes it more clear to understand what you're talking about. By all means, do that. Include things that you thought you'd find and you didn't. Um, and those you didn't expect to find, right? So talk about, well, I thought that students would say, you know, missing assignments would be their biggest reason, but that's not how it turned out. It's okay to not be right about your expectations. That's why we do research. You know, a lot of people think X will, you know, introducing X will do Y, and then they do the research and introducing X leads to Z, right? So that's why we do research. So it's okay that that happens. Um, these are your conclusions. Again, it's not the conclusion of the paper. We call that a summary, as you guys know. Uh, then you're going to write recommendations, and there are two kinds of recommendations. And you should include both of these in your paper. The first is a recommendations based on the study outcomes. So who... Uh, if for this, our, our question about attendance, you know, what would be some recommendations for faculty to help improve attendance or for students to help improve their own attendance? Uh, those would be recommendations based on the study outcomes. What does the study tell us that would work maybe to improve attendance? And then the other one is recommendations for further study. So if you think of it this way, it's like, how can I do this study or extend over or extend the study to get even better results and give me more ideas about how this could be used, right? So recommendations for sort of the end users and recommendations for extending or redoing or furthering the study. And then at the very end of the paper, you have what we call end matter. The first one is a references page. Uh, you need to list these in alphabetical order. They need to be um, double spaced all the way through, not in between the entries, but all the way through, just double spaced all the way through. And then each entry, each source, needs to be formatted in a hanging indent. And that's just basically where the first line is uh, justified left and every other line that comes after that in that entry um, should be indented about five spaces. Um, Google it if you're confused about that. It has to be properly formatted, formatted in APA style so you can um, 
there's different sources. There should be a help guide in Canvas, but you can also go to the Purdue OWL site, the online writing lab site we talked about before. Uh, and then the other end matter is appendices, and um, each separate item should be a separate appendix. Appendix is single, uh, singular, and appendices is plural, just so you know. Um, and you letter those. You don't number them. You letter them. So here's an example. You would have the appendix A, B, C, D. Um, and then the title of the item, and then the actual item, and it would look like something like this. It would need to be bold because those are headings. So appendix A, my appendix A for this would be the survey, and then I would put the survey in there. Because uh, that's not something you necessarily want to put in the paper. So anything that's sort of longer or um, ancillary, it's important, but it doesn't need to be in the paper. You can put in the appendix, appendix um, if you think it will add meaning and understanding to your paper. What we talked about in this last lecture is how to start that research study report, the five chapter research report and what goes into that, um, the contents of it, and then the end matter. So now you should be ready to go out, do your study, write it up very well so that other people can read and understand what you did.